it's here in person or via our live stream, we're glad to have you with us. Just a few quick reminders before we get started this morning. Uh, today, of course, is family day, and you know the routine for that. We have a carry-in dinner after the second service. Everyone is invited to that. Uh, also, I need to note that I need to meet with the deacons for just a few minutes after the carry-in dinner. Also, today we're kicking off, uh, we, we call a special meeting, but it remains to be seen. Uh, we have an evangelist here this morning, and Brother Tully, a good, dear friend, and we're trusting that God will use him. Uh, because we say we have a revival meeting doesn't mean we have a revival. So right. we're, but we're praying that way that God will do something special in hearts. Uh, that is, he's going to be sharing this morning in the uh, 10 o'clock service, also in the 11. And then Monday night, Tuesday night, and Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. So encourage you to come, be supportive, invite folks, be praying. Uh, again, that God will do something special in our midst. We're glad every year when Brother Tully comes. Uh, you know, we just can't find anybody else, so we have him come back. <laughs> now, he is a, a dear friend, a real, I don't know, you know, I, I don't know what other people receive, but I'm always blessed and encouraged when he comes. Just a good preacher, faithful to the word, uh, doing good work, and, and it's just good to see people just, Staying right in there. Now, we had to cancel this meeting twice. Uh, once for uh, his back problems, and you remember that? <laughs> the second time we were shut down for COVID, so uh, we we're glad that we finally got it, got, are getting it off the ground this morning. All right, um, let's sing a song. Dan's going to come and lead us this morning. Let's stand together, turn to 277, 277.
we are so grateful that you're going to come someday. Yes. Lord, we do ask that you help us to be prepared. <coughs> and just right now, Lord, we just pray that you'll help us uh, in this hour, that uh, you help us to focus in on what you want us to from your word. Yes. Just help us to take it in and then help us to put it in, in practicality. It's all yours, brother. That's got to be the most flowery introduction I've ever had. <laughs> I already said all that stuff. It's, it's all yours, brother. <laughs> I was in a church in Crosby, Texas. The pastor down there was a little World War II Iwo Jima vet. I don't know what that's for. Need to turn, um, I'm glad you pointed it out. Need to turn that on. And I, um, he, he just saw his, he was from the old school. I mean, he was older than the old school. He'd sit over there on the platform. When it came time for me to preach, here's how he introduced me. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. Just a wave of the head. See, I did anyway, better than that. Yeah, he's, would you hush up trying to preach? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's a delight to be back again. I, I uh, missed getting to come in the spring, but I'm glad we get to come uh, this time of the year and it's uh it's a great delight to be here and to see some old faces and some young faces too and uh, just to renew old acquaintances good to see brother bill again my old landlord brother bruce my old landlord and brother morris my joke teller i hope you still take the offering because i need some new uh, humorous sermon illustrations preachers don't tell jokes we tell humorous sermon illustrations <laughs> Open your Bibles this morning, please, to John chapter 4. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Hold my horse till I get on. John chapter 4. And, uh, Pastor, the books in the Bible are not in alphabetical order. You have to know where it is. John chapter 4. Help me. <laughs> I can't. I can tell you what page it's on, but you probably don't have the same Bible that I have. John chapter 4, I'm going to read beginning with verse 1. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees have heard that Jesus had made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples, being good Baptists, are gone away and in the city to buy something to eat. <laughs> then said the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is, that saith unto thee, Give me the drink. Thou wouldest, thou wouldest have asked him, and he would have given thee living water. Let me read that sentence again. I call that the most loaded sentence in the Bible. It is literally pregnant with doctrine. And I'll show you what I mean in a minute. Jesus said, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith unto thee, give me to drink. Thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Heavenly Father, thank you again for your word, which always is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. I pray that during this first service, you'd help that our hearts would be open and receptive to your word, and our minds receptive and our ears attentive. Would you challenge us and, and meet every need that's represented in this room? And Father, if there is perchance one here who's 
never been born again. I pray that you'd help that one to realize and sense, unable to feel his or her need, but once and for all be willing to turn to you and be saved. Lord, whatever you do, accomplish in our hearts this morning, I give you my solemn promise that when it's all over, we'll be most careful to give you all the praise and all the honor and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to preach, teach, you can call it what you want. They asked me at my church, you know, with this COVID thing, I had a number of meetings postponed and some canceled. And, and our church has been in between pastors since, since the end of December. And uh, our pastor of 43, 46 years, my pastor of 23 years, just went to be with the Lord the day before his 85th birthday, a week and a half ago. But anyway, they, they, so when I was home, all that time at home, why I had, um, well, I got called on a lot to preach the Sunday morning service especially. And, um, uh, you know, when you get my age, you'll, be, you'll get in the middle of a sentence and forget where you were headed. <laughs> uh, but anyway, it's good to be back. Good to be back here again. If I think of where I was headed, I'll write it down and tell you after the service. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm going to preach to, well, I don't know what it was. Um, I told you, didn't I? <laughs> they, uh, they, they, they would come to me and they'd say, are you preaching today? And everybody wants to know before it's announced, are you preaching today? Are you preaching Sunday? And I'd tell them, let's wait till it's over. We'll decide what to call it then. <laughs> and uh, well, we're going to do that this morning. I don't know if this is going to be called teaching or preaching. Now, I apologize for the raspiness of my voice. I don't know if a lot I can do about it. I was in a meeting in um, Rutgersville, Virginia. Don't ask me where that is. It's about an hour and a half this side of D.C., near Culpeper. And uh, it was a Sunday to Sunday. I'll be there again this September. I've been there every year for many years that week, their anniversary revival. They start Sunday morning. They end Sunday night the next week. And... Um, I was preaching on Thursday night and my voice completely left. I was in a whisper. That's all I could do. So I finished the service. Preacher took me to the, uh, to the hospital that night. And um, he looked at him and he said, Now you have laryngitis. Not the kind that can be fixed with medicine. He said, The only thing you can do to help your problem is keep your mouth shut for three days. <laughs> That's what I said. And uh, I said, Doc, you don't understand. I'm a Baptist preacher. That's like asking a porcupine to give up his needles, you know. <laughs> and uh, so he said, well, it's the only cure. So they got somebody else to preach for me on Friday, and they canceled the service on Saturday. And I whispered through the services on Sunday. And uh, But anyway, so that's the, that's the reason for the raspiness. Some places I go, they don't have a good sound system. I get a handheld mic. This morning, I want to teach a lesson, if you please, on, on the, the most, the, most um, the fullest and the most loaded statement in all of the Bible. Uh, usually when you make an announcement like that, I think you're going to preach on John 3.16. Well, that's the most popular one. When I say the most loaded, I do not mean to, to uh, disparage any parts of the Bible. It's all the Word of God. It's all loaded. Amen. Even those weird names uh, in the Old Testament, they're part of the Word of God just as much as any other part. Uh, and I understand that. But I, this particular sentence, and we've just read it, is literally pregnant with the doctrine of soteriology. See, that's a big word. What does it mean? I don't know. <laughs> you know, if, if, if just every now and again, the preacher has to throw out a big word to make him look smart. <laughs> Uh, it means the doctrine of salvation. Right. And this sentence is loaded with it. Now in the text, Jesus and the disciples are going from the region of Judea, which is the southern region, up to the region of Galilee, which was the northern region, where he spent most of his time in the ministry. And for that matter, where he grew up. And those two regions, Judea in the south and Galilee in the north, are separated by Samaria. The area, the region of Samaria. Normally, in fact, in other occasions when Jesus went from Galilee to Judea, the Jews would cross the river, the Jordan River. 
and they travel as far as they needed to go and cross the river again just to avoid facing the Samaritans. The reason is the Samaritans were not real Jews. They were not full-blooded Jews. They were half-breed Jews. During the Assyrian captivity, the, the Jews that were in that area mixed with the Samaritans and marriage produced a half-breed race and so on. Uh, and because there was animosity between the two, the Jews would often avoid that area, even if they had to go way around. Now, listen carefully. From central Judea straight through Samaria to, to central Galilee, about 80 miles. Now, they traveled in that day mostly by Shanks Pony, as on foot. Uh, and uh, that's, a, that's a good, a good eight days. Excuse me, that's a good, yeah, that's a good. Uh, for four, four to eight days journey, and I'll pass you the wall. Uh, from, from Judea, uh, just to sign, the Bible says that Jesus felt impressed, felt a need to go through Samaria this time. Normally, even he and the disciples would go around. It says Jesus must needs go through Samaria. I, I'm fully convinced that in his omniscience, he knew that there was somebody that he'd run into who was ready to be saved. Amen. And so he must needs go through Samaria. When they got to the city of Sychar, outside the city was a well. It was noon, midday. And a woman of ill repute, and that's all that I'll say about that, came out of the city to the well to draw water. Our women did not go to the well in the, at noon or in the afternoon. They went early in the morning. I don't know if that's where the old codgers of McDonald's picked up the idea of, you know, gathering to do their little morning gossip over some real strong coffee or not. But it was sort of like that. However, she wasn't welcome with them. For the simple reason that she knew their husbands better than she knew them. That's all, all I'm, I'm going to say about that. And so she went in the midday. Jesus was weary. If they'd been traveling since sunup, he'd probably already traveled a good 10, 15 miles maybe. And so he got, he got tired. And he sat on the well for a rest. In the meantime, his disciples decided they'd go into town and pick up a few double meat whoppers with cheese. <laughs> Hold a pickle and onion, extra mayonnaise. Well, they went in time to get something to eat. In the meantime, this woman of ill repute, this Samaritan woman, came to the well to draw water, and Jesus struck up a conversation with her. I mean, he, struck, he initiated the whole thing. And um, before, before he left that afternoon, that woman got saved. In essence, what Jesus said to her, if you just sort of summarize the whole conversation, was this. He said, lady, if you switch wells, you'd never thirst again. Right. And she did. She dropped her water pots. Her little Samaritan legs carried her as fast as she could run into Sychar. She told all the men, all the men, do I need to say any more about that? She told all the men, I want you to come with me. I want to introduce you to somebody who told me everything I've ever done. Now, that wasn't the truth. He hadn't told her everything. She was exaggerating. But she was a woman. Don't be too hard on her. Leave her alone. <laughs> I, 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 I knew Pastor would say that because his wife's not sitting there next to me. Uh, the truth of the matter is, if Jesus had told you about some skeletons in your closet that he had no reason to know anything about. You'd have thought he'd do everything too. And so she brought the male population of the town out to the well. And half of them, the scripture tells us, half the male population got saved because of her own testimony. They saw her, they listened to her, they watched her for a short while and they detected something different in her. And they got born again. And though she could not win, she brought to a soul winner who could, Jesus himself, and he did. 
Now their conversation, let's back up the reel a little bit. Their conversation at the well began like this. Jesus said, give me the drink. His brother retired, he's thirsty. Hot Palestinian son. And she said, how is it? She recognized him to be a Jew. She said, how is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which I'm a Samaritan? The Jews don't have any dealings with the Samaritans. I mean, surprised that you're here. And Jesus made the statement, if thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that saith unto thee, give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked him, and he would have given thee living water. Now, I'm sure there's much more that we're going to have time to bring out this morning, but I find at least seven major characteristics about the doctrine of salvation in that, in, in that statement alone. You know, you don't have to read in between the lines to get what Jesus was after. Uh, and here you don't really, it's right on the surface. All you have to do is stop long enough to think about it. Sometimes we're so quick to rush through a little Bible reading as though we're a horseshoe or a you know, four-leaf clover or a rabbit foot. So we have a better day. Sometimes you just need to slow down. Pay attention to what you're reading, what you're studying. This is an absolutely uh, pregnant with the doctrine of salvation statement. If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, give me the drink, thou wouldst have asked it, uh, and he would have given thee living water. Now, I want you to notice about seven things in that statement, and, and then we'll uh, give you a break. And, uh, but if you try to leave during the break, your car will self-destruct. <laughs> We've already fixed it. Uh, if thou knewest, uh, notice Jesus did not say, if thou thinkest. He didn't say, if thou hopest. He didn't say, if thou surmisest. He didn't say, if thou guessest. He said, if thou knewest. Listen to me carefully. Salvation is sure. Amen. God does not offer a hopeful salvation. And no such thing in the Bible. That's why I make, a, especially when I'm witnessing, sometimes when I'm preaching, I ask the question, are you 100% sure for a Bible reason if you died, you'd go to heaven? How many have tried to keep the conversation down on their level? And, uh, you know, if they're honest, they'll either say, yes, I am. If they're saying, no, they'll say, no, I'm not. Something of that nature. You know, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13, these things, the Bible, are written to you that believe. 95% of the Bible are written to believers. Only about 5% unbelievers. Right. Yeah. He said, these things I've written to you that believe so that you, you who believe, might know, K-M-O-W, not hope, not think, not maybe, not spit on the floor, slide under the door at the last minute. He said, I wrote these things so that you could K-N-O-W. No. That's 100% assurance that you have. By the way, that's present possession. You, I've said this here before. I'm sure you do not get eternal life when you die. You get it the instant that you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. God instantly places his life in you. Amen. You even get his nature. And I don't understand all the ramifications of that, but the Bible says you do. I'm saying, they were, I, I, by the way, by the way, by the way, down around there, there's a whole bunch of folks who claim to be Baptists. They're, the national headquarters is 45 minutes from my house. But they, they, among other things, they deny the very clear Bible doctrine of eternal security. Right. You study history. You will find that if you don't believe in eternal security, which is the clear Bible doctrine, historically, you're not even a Baptist. Sorry. Sorry, Charlie. 
Uh, the fact of the matter is, that John said, these things have I written unto you that you might know that you have eternal life. Salvation is sure. So Jesus didn't say, if thou thinkest, or if thou hopest. He said, if thou knowest. God promised eternal life to all who believe. And in Titus, it even says, the God that cannot lie, not only does not lie, he doesn't have the ability to lie. His holiness, because he's holy. If thou knowest, salvation is sure. The gift of God, salvation is free. You know, we talk about salvation being a free gift. But the truth is, free gift is redundant. It's unnecessarily repetitive. I mean, if it's a gift, it's free. If you've got to pay to get it, it's not a gift. If you've got to pay to keep it, it's not a gift. If you have to meet a standard or work to get it, it's not free. It's not a gift. If you've got to work to keep it, it's not a gift. Jesus did not say, if thou knowest the remuneration of God, he said, if thou knowest the gift of God. Amen. He didn't say, if thou knowest the reward of God, he said, if thou knowest the gift of God. He didn't say, if thou knowest the compensation of God, he said, if thou knowest the gift of God. He didn't say, if thou knowest the bonus of God, he said, if thou knowest the gift of God. Salvation is absolutely free. Amen. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that, even the faith, is not of yourselves. It is the, even it, the faith, is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If you could, if you could merit one moment in heaven, you'd spend that moment walking around bragging on yourself. All right. Nature of the beast. Salvation is a gift. When Jesus died on the cross, he made seven statements while on the cross. Seven that are recorded in the Bible might have made more. The first he made at nine o'clock in the morning when they were nailing him to the cross and it was a prayer in which he called God Father. The fourth or the very central statement he made at three o'clock in the afternoon after the world had been drowned in darkness for three hours just prior to the lights coming back on. And it was a prayer. But he couldn't call God Father. We'll talk about that later. At the end of his, at the end of the day, would have been four or five, maybe closer to six, somewhere right toward the evening. Jesus made this he made another prayer, but it, the seventh, but the sixth statement of Jesus on the cross was three words. It is finished. It is finished. That means, neighbor, you cannot add to it. Right. You cannot even adorn it. You can't even print it up. When Jesus died and made the statement, it is finished, that's all there was to the payment for salvation. Of course, he was buried and rose from the dead for our justification. It is finished. Paid in full. That means you can't add to it. That means you can't subtract from it. Hallelujah. That means you can't multiply it, nor can you divide it. If thou knewest, salvation is sure. The gift of God, salvation is free. And by the way, that gift is offered to all. Can I use a Hebrew phrase? You don't mind, do you? I don't give a stink. <laughs> it's Hebrew. What the Calvinists say, salvation, according to the Bible, is offered to everybody. Amen. Whosoever. I'm glad he said whosoever. If he'd put my name in there, it would have left you out. Or whosoever. Even the last invitation of the Bible is for whosoever. Him that was a thirst and whosoever. Salvation is a gift that's offered to all. Amen. All men. Salvation is a gift uh, that costs you and me absolutely nothing. 
not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. So the first part of the sentence, if thou knewest, salvation is sure. The gift of God, salvation is free. And who it is, salvation is in a person. Salvation is not in a plan, it's in a man, the man Christ Jesus. Salvation is not in a program, it's in Jesus Christ. Salvation is not even in a prayer that you say, I double dog dare you find anybody in the Bible who even prayed a prayer when they got saved. But that is not recorded. Right. Salvation is not in a plan, right. it's in a person. Amen. Salvation is not in a project, it's in a person. It's, a, it's entirely in the person of Jesus Christ. John 14, 6, you know the verse. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father. That's for salvation or thereafter. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. Jesus is not the way shower. He's the way. Amen. Jesus isn't the truth teller. He is the truth. Amen. Jesus is not merely the life giver. He is the life. Amen. Jesus is the way. Without him, there's no going. Jesus is the truth. Without him, there's no knowing. Jesus is the life. Without him, there's no living. I'm saying, neighbor, salvation is in a person. Somebody says in our day, they say it more often. Well, you know, I believe in Buddha or I believe in Allah. It doesn't really matter what you call him. Oh, it does matter what you call him. That's Hebrew too. Yeah. It does matter what you call him. The Bible says, they that know thy name shall put their trust in thee. The Bible says in Acts 4.12, Neither is thou salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. It doesn't matter what you call him. Amen. It doesn't matter who he is. Yeah. If thou knowest, salvation is sure. The gift of God, salvation is free. And who it is, salvation is in a person. That saith unto thee, give me to drink. Salvation begins with a thirst. You will never be saved until you're thirsty for it. Well, that's just a side step way maybe of saying under conviction. You know, down where I'm from, they talk about a lot about you got to be under conviction. You got to have I understand what they're saying. The Bible word is not conviction. The Bible word is reproof. Yeah. I mean, every, everybody's convicted. But the trouble is most of them don't feel the reproof of being convicted. Um, but the fact is, uh, you got to admit, nobody come, no, in the last invitation of the Bible, and it's in Isaiah 55, 1 as well, last invitation of the Bible says, he that is thirsty. Jesus said, if any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. John chapter 7, I believe, 1. There's a thirst involved. But you know something? God thirsted for you to be saved long before you did. Yeah. Amen. That thirst begins with God. God said, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked should turn from his way and live. Jesus held us from the hillside, his arms up toward Jerusalem, and cried out, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often will I have gathered thee? Jesus said, if any man thirsts, let him come. Long before, and, and, and his thirst is revealed all the way back in the Garden of Eden. Long before you ever thirst, God has been thirsting for you Amen. to be saved. He has a craving. He has a burden. The Bible talks about God's the burden of the Lord. And his burden is to see sinners say, There's only one thing that I know of that takes place on earth that causes heaven, God's home, to rejoice. Rejoicing in the presence of the angels. And that's what a sinner on earth gets saved. A sinner repents and gets saved. So, 
Well, salvation is in the thirst. God thirsts first. And then you and I thirst. You know, uh, God expressed that thirst. You remember in, um, in uh, Luke chapter 15, there are what appears to be three parables. It's actually one parable with three chapters. Right. So Jesus spoke a parable, and then it gives the three. What's about a lost coin? What's about a lost sheep? And what's about a lost son? Right. The coin was lost due to no fault of its own. The sheep was lost out of stupidity. I'm sorry, sheep are stupid. Yeah. They're dumb animals. And the son, he was lost on purpose. And the emphasis of that entire parable, all three chapters, is how God goes out of his way and yearns, yearns, thirsts for people to come to him. That's what the whole thing is about. You remember when Jesus was hanging on the cross? You lived back then, Pastor, you remember? You remember when Jesus was hanging on the cross? Well, he's got white whiskers, what he's saying? <laughs> Well, when it was those seven sayings of Jesus, one of them was, I thirst. Now, naturally, he wouldn't be thirsting. He'd been on the cross already for five or six hours at least. And his, without a doubt, his, his, his throat was swollen shut, and, and his lips were cracked and bleeding, and his tongue was swollen and cracked. And he'd been without liquid nourishment for quite a while. And he cried out, I thirst. And I'm convinced that it wasn't just thirsting for water. Without minimizing that, one thing is he was thirsting to be back in fellowship with his father. I mean, all the way back, and I know this is violating what the word eternity means, but we have to put it in the context of what we understand. All the way back in eternity past. From then, until the incarnation. God the Father and God the Son had full, complete, 100% intimate oneness of fellowship. Right. And communion. Then came the incarnation. Jesus left the presence of his Father came to earth. He still fellowship with his Father on earth, but not like he did then. But now, on the cross, he's out of fellowship. On your behalf and mine. He has become our sins for us. Our sins were on his shoulders, they were in his body, and he became sin for us, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. And I'm convinced that when Jesus cried out, I thirst, he was thirsty to be back in fellowship with his Father. Well, I can't help believe that he was also thirsty for sinners to be saved. Amen. That's why he was dying, wasn't it? Right. That's why he came to begin with he came to seek and to save that which was lost. So Jesus cried out, I thirst. The thirst begins with God, but sinner, you have to thirst as well. Isaiah 55, 1, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, let him come and drink. Last invitation in the Bible, Revelation 22, 17, let him that is a thirst come. He'll never be saved. He'll never be saved. Until you want to be saved. You can go through all the polywanic crack of prayers you want to. Because somebody else wanted you to do it. Or because your friend did it. But you'll never be saved. You know, we say, we say that one got saved. That one really got saved. That's the only kind of saved there is. <laughs> You're either saved or lost. Are they really saved or really lost? But you'll never be saved until you thirst. Until you want to. If thou newest salvation is free the gift excuse me salvation is sure the gift of god salvation is free and who it is salvation is in a person that saith to thee give me the drink salvation requires a thirst thou wouldest have asked him salvation's for the asking i don't know why people i don't know why people want to muddle the waters when it comes to salvation now, the Bible says uh, that it's a gift, gift of God, eternal life, free. The fact is, if you could earn one moment in heaven, you, you'd go around boasting about it. You would, right. nature of the beast. 
But when Jesus said, uh, Thou wouldest have asked him, he was illustrating that all you've got to do if you believe is ask him. Well, then the Bible say in John 1, 11 and 12, or John 1, 12, that if thou shalt receive whosoever, how does that word start? The kingdom of his own is over received him not, but as many as received him. How do you receive him? Ask him. So just ask him. You don't have to you don't have to pray a flowery prayer. You don't have to show off a lot of theological knowledge. Just ask him. You might not even understand what you're asking for. But if you'll ask sincerely and believingly, he'll save you. Let Romans 10 13 say, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If thou knowest, salvation is sure. The gift of God, salvation is free. And who it is, salvation is in a person. That saith to thee, give me to drink. Salvation requires a thirst, begins with a thirst. Thou wouldest have asked him. Salvation is for the asking. And he would have given thee. Salvation is promised. I like the way Titus put it. Or Paul did rather to Titus. He said, the God that cannot lie. The God that cannot lie has promised eternal life. He can't lie. You know, if, if you've asked it, God don't lie. God don't lie. That's pretty good Hebrew too, isn't it? Yeah. Salvation is for the asking. Uh, and then, quickly, eternal, uh, uh, he, he said, Thou was the master, he would have given the promise uh, living water. Salvation is eternal. Living water, living water satisfies a thirst in your life. And it settles your eternal destiny. I'm sorry, but there's only one definition for eternal. And it's eternal. God promised salvation to all who would ask. Of course, you're not going to ask unless you believe. But if thou knewest, salvation is sure. The gift of God, salvation is free. And who it is, salvation is in the person. But ask it of thee. Give me to drink. Salvation begins with a thirst. Thou wouldest have asked it. Salvation is for the asking. And he would have given me. Salvation is promised. Water. Living water. Salvation. Settles a thirst. Now if you haven't done it before, I hope and pray that you respond the way that woman did. She believed. Her prayer, if she even prayed, is not even recorded. But she trusted Christ. And when she got home to all those former business partners, <laughs> boy, you talk about politically correct. <laughs> they immediately recognized a big change in her. She didn't even have to have a Romans Road soul winning course. She just said, come on. I'm going to introduce you to somebody who told me, surely he knows everything. I don't know what else she said, if anything. But notice her response to the whole message of Jesus was she got saved and she immediately sent out to tell others what had happened to her. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, which is alive and powerful and, and uh, able to do what only you can do. And I pray that if there is one here today who is not saved, you'd help that one understand and see and feel their need. Be willing to turn to you and be born again. I pray that you'd have your will done. Bless the service to follow. In Jesus' name, amen. Now you notice Pastor